testing. Is this thing on? Testing, testing. It was it was me being stupid. I had basically had the um, power adapter plugged in because this laptop is less forgiving than other ones, and if the battery gets way too low, it doesn't give me much time. And everything looked like it was plugged in, but I think it was just a fraction sticking out. And once it goes ding ding, uh, Windows uh, gives you a little beep before it does whatever. And then by the time I went to reach to try and grab it, it was already killing the stream. I wish it was a better story about the peppers killing the stream, but it's not. <laughs> anyway, um, is this thing still alive? Okay, good. Camera didn't crash yet. That's good. Um, so, what I was going to show you was blue cheese. A fungus we like. Actually, it's a couple things. It's a fungus and a bacterium, because the bacteria makes the cheese. And the fungus makes the veination and the extra fuzzy bits that give you the extra flavor. But bacteria generally is responsible for cheese. Which is why another reason why bacteria are wonderful, even though they can kill you and do horrible things. We need them for decomposition to make things recycle and also to make wonderful cheese. <clears throat> personal with some nice blue cheese fungus. Look at that, you can see how it's kind of bore through the cheese. It made these little lobes and stuff. Basically the, uh, the fungal mycelia individual little rootlets called hyphae, those little hair-like structures you see when it looks so fuzzy. Uh, the whole thing is called a mycelium. And a mycelium can be the size of a football field or bigger in one organism. They're just incredibly diverse, huge organisms. Um, and uh, so when you see a mushroom or a shelf fungus or some of other ones, uh, various other formations out there. That's just the fruiting body, which creates the spores and stuff to, to spread to basically spread the spores out to other places. Um, but all the action and majority of the organism is underground, just like an iceberg. Majority of it is underwater. Um, so fungi are pretty damn amazing. Of course, you get beer because of them, because of yeast, and you get um, all kinds of other cool stuff because of fungi as well, but they can also be horribly debilitating, and if you ever had athlete's foot or jock itch or one of those things, they're pretty terrible, <laughs> but they can also make wonderful cheese and beer and other things, so it's a mixed bag just like everything else. Humans can be terrible as well, but humans can also be wonderful. So there is a nice section of blue cheese. I'm going to see if it's probably not very translucent, but let's give it a shot. definitely infiltrated much more than you can see from the surface. That's those little hyphae. They just puncture through just like tree roots through stuff. Digesting as they go to tunnel through. And, uh, so yeah, that's, that's blue 
cheese. So I thought it would be fun is to take blue cheese. Sometimes they break and stuff, so I have to buy a couple more boxes of slides. I go through pretty quickly, but let's take a little piece of this blue cheese. Kind of smear it on a slide. I keep some of it intact, so the hyphae won't get all smashed. That still might be too thick. here. Let's see if this damn thing crashes again. Nope, it's there. Okay. So you can see the... Uh, that's interesting. So some parts are quite thick. it out enough. So, it sounds unappealing, but if you remember the mucus slide, it made it kind of look like this. <laughs> but, uh, so you can see the, the creamy bits of the cheese spread out there, making a thick layer. And then some other really thick parts here from separate out enough of the mycelium to see any structure of the fungus. You can definitely see the little, I would call them like inclusions, kind of like in, like in diamonds and stuff. Let me put some more light through there. These little like inclusions inside the cheese. Spread, and the the red, the green is basically the kind of dark green because it's fuzzy because it's mycelium, but then it's also kind of grainy looking, and that's where the spores are formed. It's like the fruiting, but the, the equivalent of the fruiting body in a mushroom. So it doesn't look like I smashed it enough or separated enough to really get a good look at mycelia. can clearly see through the cheese, the dark inclusions of the, um, the areas that would be like spore producing. And the spores are much smaller than, than what we're looking at. This is pretty low power. Spores are basically about the size of pollen. Could be smaller. So you'd have to basically, like these little dots you see on the frame here, some of these may actually be spores. It's hard to tell at this, at this level. But since they, they came from uh, the cheeses, I kind of spread it out. They may have spread onto the slide. So, nice clump of, those might actually be some little spores in there, little matrix of cheese. I'm not seeing um, nice hyphae, and it's possible that uh, the blue cheese fungus may not have very defined hyphae. It might be kind of smushy. I've looked at it before, but yeah, it's kind of fun to see those little areas inside there. That's kind of some hyphae network there. Can you see that fine network? It's a little hard to see on the camera. The eyepiece always looks better, but let's see if I can boost this guy. Take this out a little bit. 
So it's kind of a fine network there. And there's the discolored region. That's kind of diffuse and spread out there. And there's some tiny little lines between all those diffuse bits. And that's some of the hyphae, fungal hyphae forming a whole mycelium. Yeah, the death of a cell's pretty brutal, huh? <laughs> and I kept getting those too. It's just dumb luck. I think several streams in a row I had some amazing dramatic death of a cell footage that was just, you know. There's only one other time I've seen death of a cell footage or someone else's channel that has really beautiful stuff, much higher quality than I could do because you know, they have like, you know, $15,000 microscopes and stuff and, and infinitely more time to do it with really high quality cameras and they actually captured a cell swimming around starting to decompose as it was swimming around it was just starting to fragment off and because as you saw protozoans can kind of like insects where they can part of their body can be destroyed and they just continue to function at least temporarily until finally they shut down and this thing was continuing to swim even though half its half of its cell quote-unquote body, half of its cell had already kind of fallen off and, and sloughed off to the side and it kept swimming and swimming until finally it just kind of just disintegrated like the death of a cell thing that I photographed. And it's just fascinating because the, there was no obvious reason why the sink just, you know, because the ones I've seen, they basically stopped moving and it, the cell, you can see the cell starting to shut down and then it's most likely a, a loss against water pressure, osmosis winds, because the active transport is no longer working to get the cell out of the water since the cell has a higher salt concentrate, concentration than the, the water. And if it's not constantly pumping, you get those contractile vacuoles like you saw in the, in the paramecia doing their business. Uh, those stop working, osmosis is going to win. There's a big like a balloon that's going to make the cell pop. And you can see. Um, as the cell dies, it starts to change shape and get a little more inflated looking, and then all of a sudden it goes, and then just, it's gone. But this thing was swimming around normally. It didn't look like terrible, and it just started to lose part of its cell membrane, and stuff started spilling out the back of it, and it just kept swimming, like, like it was fine, but it was actually in the process of dying and disintegrating. It was one of the craziest videos I've ever seen. But I was pretty lucky to get those other videos. I, that was pretty special because I, I had not seen that other than this other video I'm talking about. It's pretty crazy. So that's blue cheese. Um, not super exciting under the compound scope, but something fun to look at at least. Um, let's look at the bell pepper. That's fuzzy and nasty looking. So now I have to get it out of the bag here. Luckily it's not so far along that I don't want to hold it and breathe any kind of spores in the room, but this one's kind of bad. It has a, a big old section that's like an ulcer. The rest of the pepper looks pretty good except for a couple spots. This one's pretty nasty though. Let's move this guy aside. This guy. It's so big I can barely get it in the shot, but it's a big old nasty. Let me do the uh, top light. So you can see it's already um, caving in. It's forming a hole and depressing. You get that kind of um, saran wrap effect as it's skin is depressed and shiny. It's almost like an eye, like a fish's eye or something. But, um, you can see it's depressed. And, and thinner. And very dark. So what I was going to do is flip it over and see what's on the inside. Oh yeah, there's some fuzz. Oof. 
That's the bad kind of fuzz you don't want. That's not good cheese fuzz. That is a nice big mycelium. Fuzzy. Look at that. Get more close to that. Start to see individual threads. And then um, the darker areas have become kind of like powdery. Those are the those are the forming spores. So if you were to touch it, you get like a little dust on your finger. It changes color. development just from an embryo or even before you get to that point you start as a ball of cells called a blastula and then you immediately start hollowing out sections called a gastrula in order to hollow out all those cells have to die to make room for other things to form which eventually become your body cavities and your other compartments of your of your body and your skull and stuff like that and even the skull you the kids are born with these kind of soft fontanelles and stuff but long before that as the skull is forming in, in the early version of the fetus in order to form the holes for the eye sockets and the holes for the brain and the holes for everything else that makes your skull what it is before it hardens that all has to die all that tissue has to die so you're caught just just basic development to get to a basic fully formed baby that's born has already had tons of death to even get to that stage where it's a baby and then you know then it's a constantly you know, developing and getting growing and, and you know sloughing off cells and stuff and then just continue that whole lifelong thing until you get to uh, you know certain age and you stop replacing so often <laughs> things start falling apart and all that good stuff so so there's some nice there's a little transition zone you can see the white fuzz of the mycelium almost like cotton threads against the tissue of the pepper there's the shiny bit and there's what's fuzzy it's like a transition zone there where it's all fuzz it's probably too small to, to tease it this is this knife is not the most take a section of that put that on a slide see what that one looks like
guess there's a little, they get little spores there. I broke it all apart. Let's give it some better lighting. This is kind of weird. So you see the little dots. Those little spores. It makes the stuff look all grainy. So you get the fuzzy and you get the grainy. This is very classic when you look at a really good blue cheese. You get the <laughs> big nasty mess. And then you get all these little teased fibers out here. So those little fibers kind of teased out that I've ripped open when I spread the knife across it. It's some of the most fundamental structures of the hyphae that form the mycelium. And the rest of it's still clustered together is, is a, a chunk of mycelium here. And then all those little spore guys here. cluster of it's kind of bumpy almost like a like a shape of a hand grenade with little lobes I'm trying to get the camera to pick that up it's really clear on the eyepiece but the camera's not cooperating here of it. The, the problem is this camera has this auto mode that I can't disable. It's kind of a cheap camera. I can't overexpose it if I want to. But as I flash it through you can see as it settles you get that kind of a segmentation like a cluster of cells kind of a pre appearance. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's a cluster of spores or or just very unusual bumpy spores. Let me go in one more level. Let's see what I can see here. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool there. It's so damn dark on the camera though. Why is it such a pain? structure there. It's really interesting. They got this kind of a tapered look to them too. There's a point. It is a really good shot of hyphae there. See the little branches. And if 
Have you ever seen like algae at the beach, like the coral and algae and stuff? They're these little branches that kind of they're kind of fat in some parts and then skinny where they join up. And then you get these little nodes kind of sticking off of them, which is probably where the fruit is. Probably the fruiting body's there. That little teardrop thing right there. Rotten stuff in your fridge can be interesting. <laughs> so really nice look at the hyphae there, individual hyphae. Uh, hydrilla. I don't know what that is. What is that? Sorry, I'm behind on chat a little bit. I got to look more at the screen. really clear in the scope and it's just I'm going to get a better camera because it's not doing it justice the, the delicate structure of these spore bodies here like little hand grenades but transparent uh, interesting scope whatever if you if you hold the, I, the iPhone right at the exit pupil get the proper angle so it fills the screen zoom in on the with the pinch zoom and then get the both focuses to match you have to focus the device and also make sure the phone is focusing correctly because it's auto focus for the most part uh, you can get some pretty stunning pictures it's better if you have a bracket but I'm just hand holding it right now just because it's quick and dirty but once you get the motion down it's pretty powerful just capture stuff that, you know, I've taken really good pictures of Mars this way through friends' telescopes that back when I didn't even have a telescope. But I did just go in through their high-end telescopes. Got some pretty stunning pictures out of it. Just handheld silliness. Pretty cool. Let me find a better shot of the hyphae. Uh, like, there you go. You see the little Very 3D, it's going all different directions. Um, there's a nice branch right there. Look at that. Very clear. Get it centered for you because it's getting cropped on this. basically uh, on a bigger structure like coral and algae has this almost exact same structure when you look at it at the beach but you don't need a microscope to see it and let's get another shot of that just so I have a reference picture of it This one you can actually see the end, the 
the fruiting body here. Just see that it has that kind of hand grenade appearance just before it detaches. So it's swollen, and then you get the extra detail of the lines going through it just before it separates. from junk on a pepper. Uh, Fridge, you keep entertained for you. That's funny. Hey, Catherine, how's it going? Sorry, I'm behind on the chat. I'm having too much fun with fungal spores here. This is a <clears throat> pepper, bell pepper in my fridge that I forgot to eat. I love bell peppers. This is an orange one. And uh, sat around a little bit too long, got a nice dark spot on it. And you flip it, cut it off, flip it inside, and it's all nice and fuzzy green inside and dark dark colors and um, on the dissecting scope if you go back and watch this you'll see um, basically like fuzzy hair uh, like a short haircut in the mat of mycelium which forms it's formed by these little hyphae structures all these little branches going through here basically the, the fungus version the most basic unit of the fungus is the hypha if you form a mycelial network and as I was saying before mycelial network can be as big as like a football field or bigger sometimes depending on the organism they're pretty amazing animal uh, creatures not animals um, and so these are the, the spores that broke off as I kind of macerated the the bit to sit, stick it on the slide so you can see the hyphae separated out and then the spores that broke off the fruity, little fruiting bodies and they look like little hand grenades it's pretty cool it's finally showing a decent picture now. Before it was kind of hard to get the exposure right. But nature's little hand grenades. Hydrilla's uh, water weed. Oh, it's kind of like uh, like we have. We get them out here too. Uh, some of these trees that are really nasty in the waterways. Um, damn, what was that stuff? for watching the stream and commenting that was not very nice those are all if you didn't see the notes or hear my comments at the end those are all um, on my uh, speaking of biology and nerdy stuff uh, my my soundcloud channel is named aquafex after a genus of kind of um, extremophile bacteria that can live in hot springs and acidic environments or the crazy conditions that most animals or, or other bacteria or fungi or whatever just could not survive. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I just picked that name because I always liked it. And so my SoundCloud channel so far is four parts because I'm too cheap to buy a proper one and keep filling it up. So I get all the free ones and I fill them up and I get new channels. So I have Aquafex, Aquafex 2, Aquafex 3, Aquafex 4. And on 4, I made a custom playlist of 
seven years of crap I've been messing around with before I made this synthetic channel, basically, or partly during that time. Of uh, mostly dollars jams using loopers and stuff. I, I got out of because I do IT for a living. It's like I don't want to play with computers and music all the time. It's I like VSTs, and when I couldn't afford hardware, it was a good way to go. And I still use them on iPads and occasionally on computers because they sound great. I love the Arturia stuff and the Native Instruments stuff. But that's why I bought the Machina Plus because it's basically VSTs in a box and it feels like hardware even though it's really a DAW in a box, but it doesn't feel like it. So it's like using real gear. Um, and so all those jams were made with the Looper, Loopy HD on the iPad. And most of them are, unless it says otherwise, a good portion of them are one synth all parts. So. All the drums, all the bass, all the leads, all the sound effects, all that kind of stuff are all made from one synth layered on Loopy. And then um, the custom loops are performed live DJ style to a stereo recorder once I get enough assembled. So, and you know, because you got to do it right, it's had multiple takes sometimes, right? Just start all over and you screw it up. But it gave me a lot of good practice for doing these um, live jams with the hardware jams group. And then from the thing I did last night with the modular doing all that looping and then doing the live mixes was good preparation for that so it's kind of like doing stuff live even though I'm using stems that I created um, man it was just a lot of fun and I was driving around after that thing last night like, oh, I'll do some more footage I love the San Francisco and the rain and, and the wet shiny ground that's why the movies always wet the ground down when they do those night shots because it looks so cool <clears throat> and I thought oh, I just might as well stream some stuff and I had recently a bunch of my tracks from that playlist on a USB stick so I was able to play it while I was driving around so the fidelity wasn't so great because it's you know speakers to an iPhone to a stream so it's not exactly the best uh, listening thing but if you if you liked it if you go back and listen to the I only got there I think half the playlist there's some kind of 35 tracks in there or something like that 35 40 tracks whatever um, of varying qualities and weirdness some are some are modular I think some of our um, experimental weird, weirdo things. <laughs> but toward the beginning of the playlist, it's more melodic and more kind of, you know, general purpose stuff that people would like. And then it got kind of crazy toward the end of the playlist. But, um, so, uh, what else we got? Uh, so that we have, um, Water high is sent out here. That chokes a lot of waterways. This is all the water, kind of beautiful water weed with the purple flowers that has like these little swollen areas that are air filled things for flotation. That can be kind of choking at times. Oh, tamarisk. That's the thing I'm thinking of. There's a tree called tamarisk that uh, was introduced and it chokes a lot of American waterways, um, the riparian areas and stuff. And, uh, ponds and other areas that, that you generally want to keep open and uh, they just go in there and just choke, choke, choke uh, and there's the famous kudzu which is the grass that was like the bane of the prairies back in the 1900, early 1900s supposedly I read, I read a, when I was studying botany I read a micrograph about uh, kudzu, the scourge of the prairies or it was called <laughs> and uh, another introduced plant that just takes over like a damn weed from hell um, kind of wild stuff <clears throat> oh yeah join the hardware jam group is that you're talking about Catherine it's uh, very simple you just go hardware jams it's two words on Facebook it has a little icon looks like a little kind of a group box kind of reduced looking group box and It's, uh, they have a challenge every Friday from, uh, it's like UK time morning. So by the time I wake up, it's already their afternoon. They already, some people already started on their jams, but uh, I don't have time to even think about it to usually like Saturday night or Sunday and no time to actually even work on it usually till Sunday night, sometimes Sunday, way late. So I'm always like one of the last ones to submit because work and other stuff gets in the way. And it, 
actually turns out the pressure helps me a lot to, to get motivated. Sometimes I can't think of something I like, and last minute stress. I go, oh yeah, I gotta try this, and this will be fun, and I just do something. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. And just having fun. Um, great group though. They do it every week. I think I only missed. I've been doing it since end of November last year. Um, so pretty much that's why the channel's full of jams because it's all hardware jam stuff motivated to keep going. I think I missed a couple for early vacations before I started carrying my OPZ with me. So some of the jams from when I was at NAM and at uh, Synthplex and some other stuff, I actually did jams on the on the hood of my car with a view from Mulholland Drive because it's such a beautiful view. So I was able to do some travel jams with minimal gear. But there are a couple times when I was traveling and I wasn't in a good place to connect or I wasn't motivated or something like that. So I missed maybe, out of all those weeks from end of November last year, I missed maybe two or three, I think. So it's just really fun. It's basically addictive. You just Even if you're going to make some crap, it's just fun to participate and see what other people do. You get sound packs. The last pack was great. Um, someone made a, a sample pack with a modular system using beads and uh, record all those bits and put it in sample pack and so for people who don't have modular or just like using samples use a sample pack and either fully make a track from just the samples or add it to your track or use it for inspiration to do some other stuff whatever and I was getting ready for this modular thing I did last night I said oh it's perfect I'll load the samples in my um, bitbox micro make a rhythm part out of it and then I can build some other melodic parts that I was kind of thinking about constructing and then so I was able to use that time wisely this weekend to build that for the hardware jams that aired on Monday and then I tweaked a little bit more and added some other live parts with my A-frame drum and some other stuff and that became my live set last night so in that case hardware jams actually helped me to prepare for this other thing and made it a little less stressful because it was my first time ever playing live in front of a live audience with a bunch of shit that I kind of barely knew how to use. <laughs> so it was pretty nerve-wracking. But the hardware jam prep was a, such a huge help and also helped me build most of the track. So I wasn't totally scrambling last minute to make something. I kind of already made it and I just tweaked a little bit more. Because I don't want to do the, exactly the same thing I did for hardware jams. I wanted to add to it and tweak a few things I didn't like and then add some of the live components to it like the drum some other parts but <clears throat> a lot of fun so the group is great it's great for inspiration great for um, just trying things and not really giving a shit sometimes just you know going for it doing stuff you never tried before some of the jams are, are aimed around do what you normally don't do like um, do the opposite of what you normally do when you jam use a different scale or use a different tempo or use different instruments that you never use one jam was actually use your least used instrument or instruments and for me that's easy because I have too many I use all of them all the time so <clears throat> it's hard actually hard to pick a couple to do that but so yeah it's really fun uh, and some of the ones are like movie based jams like this really weird old sci-fi movie from the 60s from the Czech Republic called Ikari XB1 and it's just a crazy ass movie it's not only a good exposed to a movie I hadn't seen before which is weird because I love sci-fi especially old sci-fi but then um, I went through and, and uh, uh, made a few samples from it used the I did a chroma key layout on my table so I was able to project the movie onto the thing as I was jammed well in the, in the, in the post as I after I rendered it it was, it was uh, just stuck in the background in the green screen and it really helped make the piece more spacey and more fun and tie the whole thing together. So it lets you try some other experiments with uh, visual stuff too. And I don't get too crazy with the visuals because by the time I'm doing the damn jam, I barely have time to make the music at all. I know some people make incredible video edits, and I love video. I've been doing videos since I was a kid, but it's just no time to do all that cool stuff. If I didn't have any other hobbies and stuff, I'd probably be doing a lot more crazy stuff. But it's enough to do the jams and participate and watch all the crazy stuff other people come up with. It's very clever. Um, lots of fun. What else did I miss here? Sorry, I'm not reading the chat like I should be. Uh, yeah, Paul, you entered a couple of jams, didn't you? I thought you, you did some stuff.
stuff with the PCB rack and some other things. That's cool. Um, and yeah, don't worry about, uh, Catherine, don't worry about, you know, quality and the way I get this out of focus here. That was dumb. You guys let me have an out of focus picture. Um, don't worry about quality or, or it's a super cool group. They're not mean. They're not judgmental. They'll always be positive. Even if it's constructive criticism, it's for the good. And they're generally very mellow. They're not like, oh, that sucked. You need to fix this. And what are you thinking? All that kind of stuff. <laughs> like some groups would be would just be awful. These guys are actually really cool. So I I, I really dig the, the, the vibe the group has and, and just the sheer talents of these guys. I mean, that's why there's, every week certain guys are considered banned as they do like people start typing ban 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 in the chat because their shit is so good they're in the wrong group right they really should be playing in a pro group but they still like to participate and have fun and stuff but it's it's cool because it gives you something to kind of aspire to or at least be amazed by um, but there are some people just week after week are just like what are you doing in this group you're too good to be here banned 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 <laughs> so, so it's a lot of fun but it does, it is kind of like an addiction now. I, I have to do one every week, no matter what. So I will lose sleep and I will, if I don't have time to do it because of a work weekend, like I have another work weekend come up patching servers, I'm still going to do one. I just don't know when. So I will lose sleep and stuff over it. But I just, I got to do it. I just, something you just, it gets in you and you have to keep doing it. Even if you're not happy with the results, you just do it, post it, whatever. Don't be precious about it, because um, they're not going to be mean to you about it. And other people are sometimes are also struggling to get something done. I, I was one of the last ones for a long time, like in the eleventh hour, putting in. Now a whole bunch of other people are putting in late, so I'm no longer the last person in the jams anymore. There's a bunch of people putting in on Monday morning, which is hilarious. So um, yeah, this this it's, it's a very loose group. They don't like put the the gate doesn't come crashing down. You're done. You can't enter now. You waited too long. And blah blah blah. Or if you, if it's a five minute recommended length and you go seven minutes, they make a comment, but they don't like not play your jam or whatever. Uh, or if it's you know, you don't have to do five minutes. You can do three minutes. This could be as short as you want to be. They just don't want like a 10, 15 minute set. Like some guys put these like dance mixes in there that go on for a long time. It's like. Uh, we have a lot of other things to listen to. It's usually like a four-hour stream, so they don't have time for everyone to do ten-minute things. And we did have a, a festival. I'm actually wearing the sweatshirt for right now um, that we all participated in, where we did 15-minute sets, and it was a, a live stream over a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We all got a time slot. We did we cheated like a Monday jam, but we all got 15 minutes that we posted. marketing stuff they made these cool like um, Instagram posts for it and uh, little video clips you know flipping through all the names really quick and then the, the t-shirts and the um, sweatshirts have like your all of your your handles on the back like it's a real concert and stuff it's a really really cool group clever um, and very welcoming and supportive so highly recommend I don't think they panned. Did they pan it? I don't remember the stream. I watched so many streams. I, they're usually really cool about it. I mean, a couple guys in there are kind of dicks that occasionally say weird stuff or in a bad mood. But you already know they're coming because they're there. And uh, that's what they do. Some people are just aren't as nice or sometimes nice once in a while. But in general, the group is very supportive and um, you know, uh, even even uh, Clownfest, Mark Gardner, you know, Piero the Acid Clown. He comes off as kind of harsh and, and gruff at first, but he's a super cool, chill guy. I've put a lot of stuff in there that I know he wouldn't like. But it's, hey, I'm just submitting it, and it's a diverse group, and they're also doing stuff. His is more of a critique. 
So his isn't just a, hey, isn't this cool? Uh, looks great, whatever, good stuff. He's actually giving you a critique on how to improve it based on his criteria, which is the whole point of his stream. So you know going into it, he's going to rate it. He's going to give it a... I mean, he never gives anything below a 6 because he's not me. But he'll be honest. He's like, hey, you know, you really need to fix those mixing issues or that one that goes whoop, whoop. It's like really annoying. you got to take that out of there. Or your mix is too harsh or whatever. Just too, many, too much treble or not enough bass. But he's generally really super positive. If he hates trance and he hates side trance and some other groups like, groups of music like that. So he'll tell you right up front, I hate this stuff. But he'll tell you the production is good at least and keep it positive. But he's more of a critique than the hardware jams is. But I like submitting to both. And a lot of times it's just my hardware jam shit anyway, so I'm not making new stuff necessarily. <laughs> my first post was just for Clownfest because I want to make sure, you know, uh, my first post was, you know, maybe taken a little more seriously. And it was fun just to something for that group that kind of fit along with the dark vibe that they often have kind of a, the angry evil clown dark kind of things that make kind of a horror horror wave thing on my machine and plus so it was kind of fun just for clown fest um, but yeah it's just you know even he comes off gruff but he's super cool and he's like pleasant on Facebook and chat with him once in a while and he has nice things to say he welcomes you into the thing he reads off your comments and so just on the surface you might seem like whoa that guy's gonna be mean to me but he's not he's unless you're a jerk or unless you're like purposely trolling him by putting really bad stuff in there just to screw with him i don't think he's gonna ever say anything bad to people he's, he's a pretty cool guy actually he just comes off crazy with his clown makeup and his yelling and his you know and he's not afraid to use profanity which is always fun because who doesn't want to use profanity he doesn't care about the uh YouTube rating stuff and the, and the whatever. It's not family friendly. He just does whatever he wants. So there are a lot of people out there who do that kind of stuff, and that's cool. So it's definitely uh, a nice uh, mix of things. Um, what else we got on this in the chat again? I'm yakking too much. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he, I mean, I wouldn't say he hates trance, absolutely hates it, it's just not really his thing, he's like drum and bass, hard techno, uh, fast BPM, lots of kick drum, lots of distortions, lots of 303 acid lines, that's kind of his favorite stuff, I don't put, I only put one in there that was acid ever, because I don't really make acid, even though I like some acid, I haven't done acid seriously since Rebirth back in the old days. But one of the Harbor Jams things was the origin of the smiley face and how it's used for acid and all that kind of stuff. And so everyone's doing acid jams that week. So I said, hey, cool, I'll do some acid stuff. I haven't done it for a long time. Just got my TB3 and uh, my uh, TR8S with a 909 um, bank in it. And then I got my uh, basically Juno 6 equivalent, the JU06A to do some nice pads, some chords and stuff there, kind of, of the time period, and uh, it's made some little silly thing, and uh, I think I submitted that for next week's Clown Fest URL thing, I don't know if you guys actually heard that one yet, but I already, already submitted Hardware Jams a couple weeks ago, so, <clears throat> so yeah, it's this, this, he has a certain style he likes, but, but again, Hardware Jams, you know, they don't critique your stuff, they may make a couple comments here and there. Some people are kind of a little bit judgy. But in general, the group is just like, hey, great stuff. Hey, really cool. Lots of energy. Ooh, that's dark. Ooh, that's fun. That's, you know, stuff like that. You know, it's, it's positive. They're not going to sit and harp on all the, the parts that, even if they don't like it, they're not going to be mean about it, which is it's just great. It encourages you to do stuff. I actually, a couple times on, on <laughs> Clownfest, I submitted some stuff because I like horror music and dark themes and dark stuff. Sad keys sometimes and all that, and uh, I started submitting a bunch of stuff that was always kind of dark and horror stuff. He's like, "Man, this is this is another horror thing. It's so dark." And, and this is from a guy who likes the dark, kind of angry, noisy techno stuff. 
but it's just the tone of mine was coming off as more like horror movie stuff and it's just you know he likes horror movies and I guess it wasn't his vibe that week or whatever so then the, the next week I sent him one of my happy jams from Harper Jams and I go well since you didn't like the dark stuff and he goes oh man I didn't mean that I don't want to get people to to, to I'm not I'm not gatekeeping and trying to get people to only do certain things I want this is a nice to be a mix of different things and stuff so he realized that once in a while he says certain things and I didn't really take it personally I was just kind of fucking with him but but he did respond and go oh man I didn't mean that and I said hey don't worry about it I'm just messing around you know but he, he does take this criticism seriously and he, and he doesn't want to be mean about it he just knows what he likes and tries to tell people in, in the system he has other producers on there sometimes to talk about their techniques and stuff but and some of them are real judgy and stuff but you know if I don't agree with them I don't agree with them I'm not going to get all bent out of shape about it so but uh, yeah good stuff good stuff boy this thing keeps losing focus I think it's starting to dehydrate there's nothing that's moving <clears throat> anyway so that's the cheese and the hyphy and all that cool shit um Oh, sorry, that was the cheese, that was the pepper. So you saw the pepper, you saw the blue cheese, um, you saw the, the fig bar. Oh, yeah, I want to try this just for kicks. I had coffee earlier today, and I put it in the fridge because I wasn't going to have it tonight to stay up for some stuff. Just for kicks, I want to put some coffee liquid on the slide. This is basically crap Starbucks coffee with the Actually, this one doesn't have any sugar in it. It's just crap. Uh, medium roast with some half and half added to it. And I want to see what it looks like. It might get little fat globules. I'm not sure what we're going to get here. So let me take this guy and try this. Without making a mess. colloid you know and you have suspension of different uh, fluids of different viscosities and densities and stuff you get a colloid and there you go it's kind of dense and has like little layers of things moving around this is my Starbucks coffee let me fix the lighting this looks like crap See all the little bits and the different layers kind of traveling around in suspension. It's like uh, fat droplets and various other things. Let me zoom in a little bit more. This might be interesting. got like little fat droplets from the cream and because it's under the lamp it gives you that brownie motion you get when the bacteria do the little dance the 
heat from the lamp is already making all the particles dance. So it looks like it's alive, but it's just, you know, grounding in motion from the heat. Well, well, it's pretty cool. Get a better light on that, it's going dark. So I had the fridge, it's still cold, and put it on the uh, microscope on a thin layer on the slide and a hot lamp. It's, it's causing a lot of that motion, it's the, the cool stuff that's pretty uniform is now separating out. <coughs> got along with the 303 structure. It's a very weird little box. It's kind of nerdy, kind of funky. I have the Roland uh, Boutique one, which is pretty good. It's battery powered. It has built-in delay and built-in distortion, which is handy. I also have the TB3 from uh, Behringer. I prefer the TB3 because it's touch. Uh, you can use it as a keyboard. It has built-in effects. Uh, and the touch effects act like an XY pad in certain modes. If you look at my... Uh, last one's called acid e jams for the, the acid challenge with the smiley face that was the first one i made in a long time and uh i was just having fun with the tv3 because it it's not just a brain and a 303 it's also uh you could just with the built-in keyboard and stuff you can play it it's just fun and even though it's monophonic um you yeah, know i was able to with the delay turned on play the little keyboard part while I'm interrupting the normal notes, the, the delay is still playing some of the background bits that got cut off. So if you set it up right, you can actually get a fairly complex performance out of the little box that you can't get out of the 303 because you can't really play it. It's just little contact buttons and not, you don't play it like a keyboard quite as much. Um, so I really like the 303. A lot of people didn't like it because it doesn't look like one and they claim it doesn't really sound like one. It's close enough. It's just the, the TB303 purist is, is at this point kind of silly in my opinion. But I understand why they would be. But I'm not precious about that. I don't want to pay two thousand dollars for a, an acid box. This one looks pretty cool. It's still kind of expensive. I can't find a cheap one anywhere. I love Dave Smith stuff. Um, fortunate to talk to him a few times when he was still alive. Super nice guy. Uh, you've got him to sign my um, Evolver desktop unit because I went to go see him do a lecture at uh, Stanford Karma.
video is still up there, you can actually watch his lecture. Stanford Karma, just look up Dave Smith, Stanford CCRMA. <clears throat> you can even hear me ask my goofy question. But if you notice, the, the video edits at that not long after my question gets answered because I actually asked something that got him thinking, talking to his co-workers in the room. And they started bringing up some things that, because I had asked about products that never got out, if they're still working on, would they ever work on some old projects or whatever. And I think somebody said, hey, we probably shouldn't talk about that because it's going to be future projects. So I was actually recording audio at the time, so I have the entire lecture, but the video is edited. <laughs> so he was protecting his, uh, his ideas, which is kind of funny. Super cool guy though. I met him in Nam a couple times and at that karma thing and it's very sad that he he died fairly young because he was a very healthy, spry kind of guy, you know, he's just didn't seem like he was out of it at all. But the body goes where the body goes, you just can't really predict that. But what a what a contribution, man. Between all the stuff he did with Korg and Sequential and working with Oberheim off and on over the years and MIDI standard, and just, just an amazing guy. I mean, Tom Oberheim's amazing too, because his synths are so amazing sounding and stuff, but, you know, as you've heard in the video I uploaded, where Tom was talking about the history of the keyboards and stuff from, from um, Synthplex, without Dave Rossum, he wouldn't have a polyphonic keyboard for the Oberheim stuff, so Dave Rossum's another amazing guy, super cool guy, approachable, funny, friendly, he's like, you know, he's a biologist like me, and got into uh, technology because you know just that's where the money was and that's kind of where his interest was making synthesizers and biology was just yeah, okay it's fun but it doesn't make any money so, <laughs> so that's why I like doing these these streams because you know I get my I get my bio fix and my science fix but I would never get paid for this shit because you know people don't put a value on this stuff it's more gee whiz and kind of fun but stuff and, and as a career you don't get paid much as a biologist ever unless you're like biotech doing genetic engineering and stuff which is not really my thing <clears throat> this is fun you get to watch the little particles dance around screensaver so I think those are fat globules and not air bubbles because of all the half and half in here and stuff I'm not exactly sure oil droplets or fat globules whatever they are um, but yeah it's, it's fun to watch the Weird kind of waves of motion from the the heat generated by the lamp starting to make nothing. Nothing's not just dance, but also it's kind of a get this surging back and forth as the kind of partially mixable fluids are kind of doing a little dynamic dance. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but it's it's, it's pretty wild. The problem with the Oberheim session is is as pretty well put together as Synthplex was. I mean, it's this guy Michael Boddicker, if you guys know him, but long time composer. He did like the Booker Bonsai soundtrack, tons of other soundtracks. He was one of the main keyboardists on Thriller. They brought him in to do all kinds of shit. So I know that the the Toto guy did some, Boddicker did some. It was like a like a uh, all star team. Stops brought all these guys in to just do all the all the crazy shit, all the best equipment, all the best players. Anyway, Boddicker's a super nice guy. I talked to him after one of the things and and told him, you know, some of the scores he did that I really liked and how, how well he's doing the show and what a great opportunity it is to meet all these people and see the 
this stuff in a smaller venue where there's more time to kind of hang out and even though it's really not because you go to the seminars the three days goes really fast and I, I didn't get the chance to play with everything and see everything I did a quick run through on one of my videos of like a, a quick tour just to show what the floor looked like but as far as going back and touching everything and playing with it really talking in depth with everybody there wasn't any time because some of the seminars were so awesome and then running to people in the booths outside, like talking to uh, Michelle Mokusa and uh, and um, Dina Perlman and stuff, who are super nice ladies. And other people I ran into here and there and hanging out with, with Manny, having a good old time, talking about FM stuff and the history of patch design that he was working on. It's just, it's just so cool to just hang out with all these people. Drew Schlesinger, that guy's amazing, super nice guy, very knowledgeable. It's just endless stuff. My brain was just screwed explode just all the not from the excitement but just all the information going coming and going and the experiences you get there and the live music and just a blast um but Boddicker's a cool dude so uh you know but even with all that th there was still some things that were a little bit weird about the show a little bit disorganized and, and unfortunately the Tom Oberheim thing they didn't think that he's pretty soft spoken he kind of needs a microphone so there's a whole group crowd around him and just straining to listen to him talk and, and uh, so the beginning of the recording is kind of low and finally they gave him a mic it helped a lot but could have been a better recording if, if they just had a mic from the beginning but it's fine he got the information so um, and I was gonna it was a live stream so I have to pull it off YouTube to do anything with it so I was gonna pull it down and run the audio through um, Isotope and Isotope RX and do some shit with it, but I'm like, eh, you know, it's good enough. You can still hear what he says. It's, again, it takes time to do that shit. I'm getting lazy these days. <laughs> still many other things to do. Yes, I've never had a chance to go to any of those kind of things. Part of the problem, like I go for SIGGRAPH stuff a lot, but the problem was on SIGGRAPH's in Vancouver, or SIGGRAPH was in um, New Orleans or something like that. I'm kind of thinking, if I'm going to go to those places, I don't want to go to an expo. I want to go hang out in those places. And uh, so that'd be a real struggle to uh, to have limited time out there and spend it all in an expo hall although the nightlife would be fun so I never went to SIGGRAPH and those other places and consequently I haven't gone to other shows in other areas like that um, never made it to Comdex before they shut down never made it to CES but they're still going so maybe one of these days I'll go to that I know the biggest draw of CES is they have the adult expo at the same time so <laughs> all these guys go out there 
and hurry back and forth between CES and the Adult Expo to po pose with the famous, their favorite porn stars. Um, but uh, yeah, Vegas is a trip. I used to go there every once in a while, but I haven't been for years. This is still too early for um, UK folks. I know some people get up early. And in the case of Wagyu, sometimes he's up still now. <laughs> so, let's just see if anyone else drops in. Wants to have any questions about anything or wants to see anything. Uh, I have other cheeses to look at. I have uh, probably some other weird things in the fridge. I'm running out of stuff for right now. gadgets before I go to bed. I got that uh, Time Tosser thing, which is a hilarious name. Horrible name for a product that's going to be marketed in the UK. But uh, <clears throat> a very clever thing. I was going to use it for my live show if I could figure it out, but I didn't have any time to even hook it up and play with it yet. So I may play with that tonight before I go to bed. It's a, a very clever hardware um, slicer, beat repeat, kind of loopy kind of thingy that's uh, MIDI synced and it's all audio there is a MIDI in and out on it but you can just do it with audio um, based on the audio coming in it listens to the, the audio path and <clears throat> it seemed like a cool thing for a modular set because you don't want to keep building these complex things because it's just too much work on the fly to do that so you build some basic layers and then you could just really just use a device like this to do extensions and kind of morphs on patterns you already have. It seemed like a really cool idea to do that, to extend a piece so it's not so monotonous and make it a little more complex, a little more um, fun and dramatic. But uh, yeah, I haven't time to play with it yet. It's because guys in Utrecht make it. Um, I guess it's mostly aimed at DJ types and stuff, but um, no reason why it can't be used for regular production or modular stuff, so a perfect circuit had it on sale when I went by there after Synthplex I'm like, oh shit, I guess if I'm ever going to buy it I better buy it now because it had, it was like, I don't know, 60 bucks off or something like that, well that's a pretty good price um, they had some other really good stuff on sale too, but every time I go by there when there's a sale it's just too damn tempting. I just don't have money for all that stuff. But there were a couple modules I wanted to get that were on sale. But it's just like, you just got to pick your battles. And I try to get something that's the best deal instead of something I really want that's a decent deal. I get something that I want at all, but get a really good deal on it. Because then, then I'll definitely get it. And if I don't get the really good deal, I'll never get it. And it could be something that's very useful, even though I'm not sure if I want it. <clears throat> it's kind of a goofy logic, but it seems to work for some of the weird stuff I bought. Uh, AES. Are you talking about Anaheim Convention Center for um, for AES? Um, NAM is usually Anaheim Convention Center. SIGGRAPH's been at Anaheim a few times, but SIGGRAPH sucks at Anaheim because it's a pretty sprawling thing, and they're cheaper. NAM is a huge conglomerate that basically has tons of money, so they really book the whole damn Anaheim thing. SIGGRAPH is cheap that way. They don't do that. So whenever they have something that's not LA Convention Center, they kind of cheap out and make it a shit, sh shitty show. So... Um, it, the, one of the best times they had that wasn't in LA was in San Diego and that was like a one time thing ever it's the same you know, com, Comic Con Convention Center it's huge and that was a blast they turned the whole town the Gaslamp Quarter and stuff into like Party Central NVIDIA was handing out 
drink tickets at their booths and stuff, or affiliated booths. So I had a whole stack of drink tickets. I didn't pay for a drink the entire night. And just walking around from bar to bar to bar had the little NVIDIA sign on it. And just, you know, got mildly smashed. I didn't want to get totally smashed and lose track of what I was doing. But it was just really fun chatting with people. And, you know, um, it was just a good time. <clears throat> Sigraph usually isn't that. The, the after parties are okay. But San Diego was just a killer year. Good times. This is getting out of focus again. It's doing that surge still. It's really wild. Hmm, this is interesting with the arpeggiator stuff. There's so much stuff now with software and modular and all these little kind of cottage things and unitasking things or, or multitasking devices and software to do so many wild things. It's just, it's really hard to keep track of. <clears throat> this guy last night who had like the best set, it was just a phenomenal set. In fact, I recorded the whole thing. Uh, I, I ran out of memory. This stupid phone is... The way the iPhone handles the memory management. If you have, if you're shooting a video and you only have like 200 megs left, it stops your video. I'm like, come on, you could have given me like another couple minutes of video with that much memory, but it, it shut off. So I still had memory to do audio recordings and stuff, which is really weird. So I did some audio recordings of the rest of the sets. And this one in particular, the guy who closed it, who's one of the showrunners, his, his set was amazing. He had this, um, 9U modular system, all decked out with tons of performance stuff and very expressive stuff, and uh, it just sounded great. And um, it uh, he had some wild stuff in there I haven't seen before. Um, so it's just it's just a huge selection of crap <laughs> to do all kinds of weird things out there, and and some of them you'd have to you know. They might not be designed for that function, but you figure it out as you play with it. And that's part of the problem with modular, why it's such a gateway. Is, uh, you buy something for one thing, realize it does some other stuff. Or there's a firmware for it that does even more, and then you end up buying like, duplicates of that, or something that's kind of like it. And pretty soon, you have so much stuff and not enough time to learn it or to really use it. Just like everything else. So it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, Perfect Circuit is the best. I, if, I don't know how uh, how Steven handles it, how Noir handles his uh, living so close to it, because it's a destination for me. I love going down there when I'm visiting something else. But yeah, living by there would just be good and bad, because they have sales all the time. You go there and play. They finally got back after COVID is waning. Now you get back to eating candy while you're there playing with stuff. So you can sit there, patch stuff. They don't probably even care if you hook up a recorder and just record some shit. <clears throat> and uh, eat candy and ask questions. And some people never buy anything. They just go in there and play. But I always, I always buy something on down there because I don't get down there often. And there's a sale and it's usually something I really want or something that's intriguing. But yeah, it's it's rough. So much temptation down there, and not just the the small stuff too. They have they carry a lot of flagship stuff. It's really a boutique store. They don't carry they carry small things. They carry a wide variety of things, but they're not big on uh, garden variety stuff when it comes to polysense and monosense and stuff. They have some really nice shit there. 
In fact, I, I, um, they're going to have to make the C-15 nonlinear. Is it nonlinear? I forgot the name of the company, but the famous C-15, um, scent that is so damn expressive. It's, uh, one of the guys who invented native instruments, basically. Um, and I was talking to them at NAM 2020, and I said, you know, this, this, this thing would be perfect at a place like Perfect Circuit in town, or nearby town. You should really talk to them, because if you're having trouble distributing in the U.S., I guarantee you they would at least carry a unit to have in the store to, because they like this kind of stuff. Sure enough, they had a short chat with them, and the guy ran into me earlier this year. Said, hey, hey, I've been looking for y'all's show. I've been trying to tell you thanks. We got we got this deal with Perfect Circuit. They've been carrying our stuff for a while. I wanted to thank you for that. I said, hey, I just told you because I love that place, and it seemed like a likely thing. It wasn't, a, it wasn't exactly a genius move, but they're really happy about it. I probably could have worked that into a deal on a C-15, but I still didn't have the money for it. But, uh, yeah. Cool stuff. Love that store. Cool stuff. Yeah, VCV is, and also some of the iPad stuff that I love so much is really super cool. Um, and the iPad multi-touch is very powerful, which in some ways gives you more flexibility than some modular hardware does. But the modular hardware, the reason I like it so much is it's it's everything I love about hardware sense with the tactile nature and the you just in that moment and you're not distracted by other stuff unless you go to another thing in the room and you just get lost in that piece of equipment you know, the setup that you built with the patch and, and iPad is less of a computer than, than a laptop or whatever so you can still focus when you're on the iPad which is why my rack is pretty cool the VCV rack thing on, on iPad but VCV rack I would on uh, computers, I tend to get, uh, oh, I could do this now. I could open this and multitask and do this other program. And, and then it's back to being potentially overly complicated. And I don't know, just, I guess, a hang up that I have when I use computers with the VSTs and stuff. I tend to get a little crazy, which is why I got away from dolls altogether. I, I mean, away from the doll altogether because it just, it's, even though uh, Machina Plus is a DAW in a box, it doesn't feel like it. And even though iPad is basically a computer, it doesn't feel like it. And uh, and even though uh, a Quantum is essentially a computer in a keyboard box, it doesn't feel like it. So it's just really fun to have this dedicated hardware to do certain things. And it still can do a whole lot, but it's still got its limitations, unlike a computer, which is kind of limitless. Especially you get into Max MSP and VCV rack and yeah, t even just reactor and, and uh, native instruments is fucking crazy. So I use the reactor subset in the Machina Plus and limits the editing and you browse presets and figure some stuff and maybe do something in the real version and port it over. But in the moment, you're just playing with the sound on a basic level. You're not constantly rebuilding stuff and making it too complicated and it kind of gets you to focus on the music and the sound effects more than the, the technical nerdy part of it and doing IT all day playing with computers the last thing I want to do is you know, I'm staring at a computer now for this but this is for a different cause and, and it's because you need a computer to stream um, at least if you want to do the chat part I mean I can stream from my uh, A10 Mini Pro straight to YouTube. I don't need a computer for that. But then there's no interactivity. I can't chat and I can't uh, play this music in the background with this little generative app. And, and So the computer is very handy for this kind of thing. But after staring at a damn screen all day and doing, you know, 
fine detail work on a screen with instruments and as much as I love native instruments and Arturia and you know I mean I even bought Nuendo the other day they had a killer deal in Nuendo I've never used Nuendo but holy moly some of the features in there for doing um, audio processing for movies and videos and uh, the integration that it can do that Cubase can't do it's pretty stunning they had like a half price sale the other day it's not even Black Friday yet it's just a, some kind of half price deal they had and I watched the video and I was like holy smokes this looks really cool now how am I going to use it probably more than <laughs> more than a couple times a year but it just it was so compelling and with my video background and uh, general audio background before I got into any kind of music stuff just doing sound effects and um, kind of Bernie Krause style of stuff you know, long after Bernie Krause was Beaver and Krause doing electronic music stuff he was this amazing field recordist guy working at California Academy of Sciences recording environments some, some don't exist anymore he's, he's a bioacoustician and and uh, studying natural environments and sounds and stuff. And he's got amazing field recordings that they used to sell at the Discovery Channel store and the Nature Company. And um, and he would use his recordings at the museum for these incredible exhibits. One was this African watering hole where they, they had this beautiful taxidermy set up with this fake watering hole. And you could just sit there on a bench. And as the day-night cycle went through with the colored lights and the, the sound shifted with, the th it was just this beautiful kind of immersive environment that you know nothing is moving but with your imagination and the sound and the lights it almost felt like being there and i've been to africa it's really amazing but long before i went to africa i kind of felt like i was there with this exhibit it was really special and so when i first bought my sample my max 2 in, in college i'm like shit i want to do bernie Krause stuff so i started doing a weird layering sampled all my animal cds and sound effects cds and doing like rainforest soundscapes it was perfect timing too because i was working at the children's zoo at the time the weekend zookeeper and the museum was doing a bunch of new exhibits and one was on tropical rainforest so i thought cool I, can i make some sound effects for it i got all the stuff so i said you build a custom sound loop tape system for the exhibit and i'm no pro i'm just some stupid guy in college you know doing stuff but because i was so interested in what bernie cross was doing i played with it a bunch i made some fun um, immersive soundscapes on loop tapes in the environment and just with my sampler and I wasn't doing any music I was just doing sound effects and field recording and sound design kind of stuff but god it was so much fun and then I finally said you know I probably should make some damn music it's been, I've had this shit for years and I've done any damn music on it at all and one of my friends um, who worked at Guitar Center was a really good like uh, jammer type guy clever and he just got me into this live jam thing long before i ever heard of hardware jams and dollars and all that kind of stuff and uh so just all that stuff perfectly primed me for the stuff i'm doing now with these different groups and it's just funny how that works out Piano Tech, I always want to try that. I think I tried a demo a long time ago, but I have no idea. They have a couple other products too, I think. Don't they, Don't they have uh, an organ version? Like a pipe organ version or something like that? And some other... It's pretty clever. I know the, the Roland V Piano came out not long after that. Now it's pretty amazing too. Um, interesting stuff crazy stuff they can do with software now. A three-wave music. I think that's where I got some of my best rare emu stuff. They used to sell the ROMs really cheap and used emu equipment really cheap. And they also had they're one of the few locations you could buy the emu blank ROMs for making your own sound sets for Produce 2000 command stations and stuff. And I ended up buying one there. And then last time I moved, it's in a box somewhere. I don't know where the hell I put it. 
This recent emu I bought used is uh, um, uh, one of the ultra, one of the last ultra samplers I made. Not top of the line, but pretty damn good. And it came with a blank ROM, which is like fairy dust. It's incredibly rare and 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 uh, precious if you like to make your own kits and then put them in this hardware. Um, so I can't wait to start programming that and use it for my command station. Because uh, those all basically work off pre-built ROMs, so the MoFat ROM and the Planet Earth ROM and the Vintage ROM and all that stuff, which are really good sound sets. I mean, they're classic. They're some, might, some might call them dated, but I think they're still really good. But to have your own blank ROM that you can flash inside of a sampler from different banks and then load that in your thing, then you have a totally custom sound bank or a series of sound banks in, in this hardware that normally doesn't allow that. It's pretty special. Hey, no problem, Paul. I'm actually going to think jet pretty soon because it's been a long couple of days and uh, I think I'm going to play with this stupid time tosser before I go to bed. It might be frustrating, so I may not play with very long. Um, but I'm glad you guys joined and had some fun. Saw some weird stuff. This is a nice little screensaver here. All these particles dancing around. and Pretty cool. Keep it on this a little bit longer. See what else happens. As the slide starts to dry up. Um, oh. So Piano Tech has roads, Worley and Honer. I didn't know that. I thought it was just piano sounds. Interesting. So if you want Orbit, uh, the thing to do now, actually it's, it's kind of a good timing if you really want the sound set from an Orbit. You get a Proteus 2000 module or you get a um, command station if you want a Groovebox thing or you get one of those things that takes the ROMs. And there's some guys online now who started cloning the ROMs. And Orbit is essentially the Rob Pappen sound sets. It's the Beat Garden and the Technosynth Construction Yard. Uh, two of the most rare ROMs out there. If you go on eBay now, they're probably $500 each, maybe more, which is totally insane because they were not that rare, but suddenly no one was selling them anymore. They coveted them, completely coveted them and, and hid them away and, and never to be seen again for the most part, except when they show up, they're crazy money. So some clever guys discovered how to do cloning. And I had forgotten I'd bought the originals at one point because I have too many ROMs and too many command stations and Proteus modules. And uh, I bought the clones on eBay and they work perfectly. And then God, probably a couple weeks after I bought the clones, I was looking at one of my other modules and I go, oh shit, I already got them in this module. Now, I wasn't mad because the clones are like really cheap. They're like 160 bucks or something like that each, which sounds like a lot, but not for these ROMs. 160 bucks is what they used to cost when they were brand new. Maybe a little bit less. Like Pro Protozoa ROM, which is Proteus 123 and a ROM, that's basically like 100 bucks usually. That's even gone up to like 300 bucks now sometimes. So, uh,. If you get a Proteus module, or any of those that take the Proteus ROMs, you find this guy on eBay. I forgot his name, but it's easy to find. It's just the cheap-ass clone ROMs for Rob Pappen, uh, Beat Garden, and Technosynth Construction Yard. Um, 170 bucks each, I think it is. 160, 170, something like that. And a module, and you have an Orbit 3. And it's not even a keyboard. You can just have the little 1U rack, hook whatever MIDI controller you want to it. And it's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than... Even Orbit 3s are expensive now because they know the sound set is the Rob Pappen one. Um, there's another Orbit you can get which is cheaper, but it's not the same as the Orbit 3. So, if you really want Orbit that badly, that's my suggestion because it's more functional and cheaper than, than tracking down an actual Orbit 3. 
But uh, yeah, it's I don't know what happened. It was I was following a thread back when it was called Gear Sluts. Now it's Gear Space, and uh, there's been a thread in there forever about these damn ROMs. I, I, I want to get a clone of the Flash ROM. I want to get a clone of the fixed ROMs, and nobody knew how to do it. There was it was like a black art. They didn't know the chipset. They didn't know the process. Uh, and a bunch of guys came in from different angles who had different expertise in the field. And I guess somewhere online they finally connected. Because it actually started even before that, a Yahoo group. Going back, God, like 2008 or maybe even older. Where they're talking about these damn ROMs. And this kind of a, a long, boring thread in, in gear space to this day. I guess until recently. They, I haven't gotten to look. Maybe they had the last year this when they fixed the, the cloning problem. I found this guy on eBay by accident looking for some other ROMs. I go, why is this so cheap? What's going on? This got to be a scam. So I said, you know, what? I'm going to buy one. It's not that expensive, and I'll see. And it worked beautifully. So I'm like, shit, I'll buy the other one now. And um, yeah, so they figured out how to do it. And Emu doesn't give a crap. I mean, ever since Creative Labs bought them and destroyed them. And they don't sell their software anymore. The software version of the ROMs, which is the uh, um, the what was it called? The was the Proteus module and the software Proteus X, I think it was called. And then there was a um, Emulator X, which I bought as well because I wanted to use some of my Emacs stuff on the computer back when I was getting more into VSTs. Um, and ended up not using it very much, but it had a lot of the em emulator libraries on there. Well, I had to get all the floppies and stuff. It was just already in software format. So <clears throat> they started coming out with ROM kits in the software as well. So you can get the Beat Garden as a ROM kit. It's software. You can get the Planet Earth as a software kit, but it's not compatible with the module. So if you wanted to use the modules and you bought the software, then you're, you got to buy it again. It's kind of a pain in the butt. And I was one of the modules because I just like rack stuff. And, uh, um, yeah, just, I ended up just keep buying the ROMs. So there are a couple of ROMs I never got. And there are a couple of ROMs that are pretty special that people don't know about. The, the ZR71 and ZR, um, uh, ZR61, ZR76 ROM, or just called the ZR ROM, actually has some FISMO transwaves on it. So if you don't, can't afford a FISMO, you can't buy a FISMO, you can actually get some of the FISMO transwaves on the damn ROM and uh, do it that way. So it's not quite the same as a FISMO, but you get a taste of it. So email has all kinds of crazy stuff ever since that Sonic merged with them and Creative Labs screwed them up. There's a bunch of stuff along the way that happened and you know now it's all now the cool stuff is all Rossum uh, electro uh, modules that's his new thing but all the stuff he did at emo is just emo is just amazing stuff yeah, yeah Fismo is crazy I I Technically, it's an island. You can't add anything to it. And you also have to use a software editor to really get under the hood to do all the features, which is kind of a shitty design, which is why some people hate the Fismo, even though it sounds cool. Um, but anything from that time period, ASR-10, TS-10, TS-12, um, SD-1, and a few other ones out there, you can load custom trans waves and do more with them than you can with the FISMO. FISMO is fixed. You can not, not add anything to it. They did happen to pick a very clever set of trans waves that are nice and work for the spacey music it's generally known for. Um, but uh, and you know something like a TS-10 you can map the, the trans waves to the mod wheel and actually sweep through it like a PPG which is really clever. So um 
a lot of you know people went to the Fismo not knowing that it's cool, but it also has a lot of limitations. So if you're happy with limitations, there's nothing wrong with it. I finally got a good one at a good price, luckily because they're, they're like insanely priced now. But um, but there are workarounds using transwaves and other things and other little techniques. And the cool thing about transwaves is some transwave apps to what was even a common app for a while. It's a little hard to find now, but it's on from the Wayback Machine somewhere uh, called Transalon, where you can actually make your own single cycle transwaves <coughs> from other bits of waveforms and stuff. And a lot of times, a lot of garbage comes out, but if you're really into it and you want to spend the time on it, Don Solaris had a whole article on it years ago about how to do it. It's pretty interesting stuff, but again, it's one of those things you have to sit and learn and be patient and get a lot of shit before you get anything good out of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, interesting. Interesting stuff. Um, one of the tracks I played on the drive last night is a Fismo, actually all Fismo track except for the uh, Mtron Pro Choir. In fact, I use one of Dave Spears' actual voices. He sings on the Mtron Pro Choir. So during COVID, he released a free isolation pack. He just got a bunch of artists together to sing various phrases and tones and stuff, and then he compiled it into a, a, a Mellotron Pro Choir pack. It was made, basically made a free download for everyone in isolation. Here's some new stuff to make music with. And all I had to have was Mtron Pro, and you can just load it for free. And so I loaded it, and I go, holy shit, Dave's got his voice in here a whole bunch. So I made that track, and then I sent it to him. I said, hey, Dave, hope you like this. I mixed you with the Mellotron Choir. And your voice is pretty good, so check it out. And he, he really liked it, which is kind of cool, because Dave, Dave's an amazing guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. Fismo's pretty interesting. But it, it can be harsh and digital if you're not careful, and it can be weird. It, you can hear on that track, I let some, some pads go a little long, because it's, it's sweeping through the transways. Like, weaving around the sound. It's pretty interesting. Um, so, they're pretty, pretty cool instruments, but, yeah, they they need the software editor. Now, luckily, someone came up with an editor that's really good called Fa FAUMO, F-A-U-X-MO, or FOMO. Um, and, uh, it's basically a hardcore FISMO editor with a really nice interface, and uh, super easy to get under the hood just like the the Proteus has tons of power in there that no one ever used Proteus 2000 command stations they actually have software modular inside there they actually they call them patch cords it literally has modular on board and you never saw it because it was poorly marketed and if you're editing to through a tiny two row window like this t standard Roland kind of display how are you going to know what kind of details are there anyway? It's not mentioned anywhere on the panel. You have to go through the manual, and even then it's kind of hard to figure it out. So they made this Pro Data Map, which is free. Some third-party guys. And uh, totally unlocks the product. And just like uh, FOMO does for uh, the FISMO. So that's the thing. You get these little tools. The problem is, you know, what happens in 10 years when no one gets FOMO to work on the new Windows or whatever? you got to keep an old system around just in case. So as long as you're comfortable with software editors, you always got to have some kind of a, a way to use it, either an emulator or a virtual machine or, or an old machine sitting around. Um, so, but yeah, once you have those things, you've totally unlocked the product. In fact, um, even some of the stuff I use a lot and like the interface of some of these editors are crazy like the sound tower company makes these incredible editors for the dave smith stuff for um, even old korg o and w uh, and some of the old waldorf stuff like the um i have a um damn what was that thing called micro q 
kind of a kind of a cut down microwave and it just sounds fun it's very digital but it sounds great and uh, they have a great editor for that and and the cool thing about sound tower is they're the first company I ever saw that made really smart randomization and patch genetics so once you find some patches you like from randomizing things and tweaking values and in a smart way you can use patch genetics to make branches of those sounds that aren't totally randomly weird different they could be similar but different enough that you get a lot of different results out of it so it just it's very clever and uh they even made iPad apps for the uh, Evolver, Polyvolver, Tetra, uh, Mofo, all that kind of stuff. So if you have any of that old DSi, um, Dave Smith stuff, they made iPad apps for that. So you can edit the crap out of anything and have to use a computer. You have a little tablet right by your, by your synth. It's pretty, really cool. So love that sound tower stuff. XL7, yeah, it's a command station. Any of the command stations, they're basically identical hardware with different face plates. So, you know, I have an XL7, I have a, um, uh, a uh, MP7, the MoFat version. It's all purple, like Barney. And, uh, you know, this, this things are great. You get four slots in there, so you just put as many ROMs as you can fit in there that you can buy. Now it's hard to buy that many ROMs, but back when they were cheap very easy to fill up four slots and uh, I like the I like the control surface I like the pads I like the three different styles of sequencing on there uh, the editing is pretty basic pretty easy for certain things and then if you want to get deep you got to use that app the app is just crazy app App makes it a totally different device. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. But, yeah, it's, they are, they have gone up in price a little bit, though. So, to get a, a command station now that's in good shape, uh, could be four to five hundred dollars. It depends. Sometimes you get lucky and find some dummy who doesn't know what he has, but, and then you still got to buy the ROMs that you want for it because they're not going to come. If they come with any ROMs, it'll be the X07 ROM, which is good. Um, just the Extreme Lead ROM, which is, you know, it's very techno y stuff, but it's not the Rob Pappen stuff. Um, and it's not the Vintage ROM, and it's not the Protean Drum ROM, which is really cool and really rare. Um, the B3 ROM, I never got because it's it was always never on sale and it's a Hammond B3 I, if I want a B3 I have other stuff it's not my favorite thing anyway so I never get, get that but uh, the you know the, the protozoa ROM is great the vintage ROM is great the world ROM is awesome I love world music and percussion and sound effects and stuff world ROM is really good um, MoFat is very good as well uh, and there's some stuff you can't get in a ROM, so I bought the rack. I bought the Carnival, which is hilarious because it's all kinds of Latino music and Afro-Cuban music, and you know, just you name it, anything that's in that kind of vein. And I'm not good at playing those kind of weird patterns and rhythms and stuff. I'm just not into the. I like listening to the music, but I don't know how to play all that stuff. So I figure Carnival would be a nice way to if I ever wanted some little bits like that just sample a couple little parts that I need or record it into a DAW and see what the keys are and learn how to play them as far as the, the piano structure goes and the, the chords and all that so I just figured it was a good learning tool as well as kind of a fun box to make Latino style music um, but yeah so they have other weird stuff out there there's all kinds of fun boxes from from Emu. Um, but essentially most of them at a certain point most of them were basically Produce 2000 modules with a new sticker and different ROMs inside of them. So you can buy them empty and just put the ROMs in there. 
You don't have to buy a Proteus 2000 exactly. You can buy a, you know, uh, Ultra Proteus. Uh, you can buy a vintage one. You can buy the Planet Earth thingy that has the four ROM slots. You don't have to have the ROM even in there. You can just load the ROMs you want later because <clears throat> they all have the ROM slots. But if they're if you're too old, they don't have ROM slots. The Proteus 123 doesn't have the ROM slots. Virtu Virtuoso has the ROM slots. Uh, a few other modules, like uh, Oddity doesn't have the ROM slots, I don't think. I think it was a, a fixed module. Uh, there's some really good websites that go through all the modules and what they do and what they don't do. That's the best way to, to look at it. Um, so you don't buy the wrong one. Because if you want to use ROMs, you want to make sure you get the slots. Otherwise, you're have to buy it again with the, with the ROM slots. Um, but yeah, it's um, lots of interesting stuff. Uh, emus, you know, I, I I liked Kurzweil in the early days because that's all I knew when I was in, in high school and just demos I went to go see and that's where I got to see Bob Moog when he was doing stuff for Kurzweil. And, uh, and then I got exposed to Emu and I go, God, this stuff is really cool and it's a hell of a lot cheaper. I can actually afford this at some point whereas the other stuff, I'll never buy a Fairlight or a Kurzweil and I eventually did buy a Kurzweil but at the time, Kurzweil 2000 or Kurzweil K250, the same one Paul Schaefer used on Letterman for like 20 years. That thing was, you know, when it was brand new, fully maxed out, it was like 16 grand with all the orchestra modules in it and, and uh, choir modules and all that stuff. It has a big heavy beast with a proper wooden key bed and a huge power supply on the floor that was also your pedal board. And uh, it's just a beast. And there's, I found one on the East Coast I would love to get. In fact, if I were crazy enough and I could bribe Paul, I could probably have Paul, yeah, I could buy it. He could hold it for me until I could actually try to ship it properly or eventually get out there to get it because the guy had a killer deal on old K250 that he's just giving away for free practically it's like a thousand dollars or whatever I always wanted one of those they're just so cool even though they're old tech they're amazing um, but uh, yeah Emu I got into Emu and it's just god their stuff is amazing even the old stuff the really old stuff it's great just love it Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, the software energies make a huge... Yeah, the, the prices have... That's what I'm saying. They fluctuate like crazy. There's a time... There's even a... a e eBay even had a ROM page where you could quickly go... And some, some guy wrote a really cool thing. It just disappeared eventually. Where it's all the ROMs, what they are, what they do, and what's their value. And and I think as soon as the ROM prices went through the roof, they just deleted the page or the guy had lost, lost interest or they, something happened to it. Because there was a time when there were like only two or three ROMs that were crazy prices. And the rest of them were pretty reasonable. And now so much because people finally caught on how good they are I mean they're old they're like you know it's it's 1990s technology as far as sample quality and layering and, and tweaks and stuff and they they enhanced them for the later 90s into the 2000s um, before you know creative labs messed them up but essentially a lot of those sample libraries are that old they're just that good and uh, now it's not modern sampling or it's time stretched so you get the speed based sampling pitch thing so you get the munchkin voices and you get the slow on the low end and stuff but that's what sampling was for a hell of a long time in fact it still is a damn Korg micro sampler came out in the era of modern sampling they should not be like an SK-1 <laughs> it should do modern sampling. So Kai could do it, but Akai wasn't doing it. I don't think it was, they weren't doing it in real time. They had to process the samples to do that. Now anything decent will do it in real time, uh, software or hardware. In fact, my favorite uh, 
sampler for the longest time was uh, Jordan Rudis has a bunch of products under his wisdom software thing. He had um, this Geo Shred, which is really cool for doing, you know, performative stuff with swam instruments like a saxophone or a trumpet, as well as guitar based stuff. But he had a thing called Sample Whiz, and you get classic sampling, which is the standard pitch based, uh, speed based pitch thingy munchkin voice and devil voice and all that stuff there's classic sampling there's modern sampling where it time stretches so you can just load one damn sample and it stretches it very well across the keys and you play things really nicely so i found a really nice hammond overcord sample loaded in there had a beautiful patch just from one stupid sample that's how it should be and then they have a granular mode so if you want to do granular stuff for sampling it's pretty cool all in one little app very easy to switch between the modes on the same sample and, um, or you can multi-sample too, I think. And, uh, it's a nice little iPad app. Hook a keyboard to it or play it on the screen, whatever. And, uh, super cool. But the micro sampler came out just before that. And it's just no, no better sample-wise as far as the speed issue than a, a Casio SK-1. It's higher fidelity sound, but it's still doing that silly munchkin voice. And that's not what I want when I use a modern sampler, or at least a sampler that's less than 10 years old. You know? But it's still a cool unit. I like the micro sampler. It's just kind of pissed me off that they didn't have the modern sampling features on it. <clears throat> yeah, Proto 2000 is usually are the cheaper ones. The custom ones that are branded because they look like they're fancier the people are are convinced oh I gotta get this one but Produce 2000 is, is the core chassis for all of those lines. They just put different branding, different stickers and stuff and they usually came branded but prepackaged with that given ROM. Which is why they had an X01 rack. Extreme, extreme lead X07 is the X01 ROM, but fattened up with more voices. It's a 32 bit ROM. 32 meg ROM. 32 meg ROM. That has uh, more samples on it. But it's really just the Extreme Lead 1 sample set, fattened up for more goodies with one. Because a lot of people never bothered to open the command stations and, and add it. They didn't even know there were more ROMs in there unless somebody told them. But there were so many sounds on the on the on the super ROMs they put in there. They were bundled with, whether it's an OFAT, the Protean drum, or the Extreme Lead, that you had tons of sounds to play with for a hell of a long time. And it's only when you just you need a lot of weird stuff, or you just want to throw money at it, that people buy the ROMs for it. But it's really the way to go is to get the ROMs. But the ones in the command stations were special. They were much heavier uh, patch count memory for samples. Um, but really no different, ultimately, than the 1U racks that were basically Proteus modules. In fact, the Proteus 2500 is essentially a command station with the pads cut off to, fi to fit in a, was it a, uh, a 4U rack, I think it is? 4U or 6U rack, something like that. Um, it's essentially a command station without the pads and the little ribbon strip. And four ROM slots and the whole works. So they, they had a whole massive product line based on a really simple design of the, the Proteus 2000 chassis. And then extra goodies if you want the, the more knobs and performance stuff on there. Pads and all that. But uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. Funny, funny, funny. Yeah, that's not bad. 300 bucks for produce. Um, I, yeah, I got lucky over time just because I was... I wasn't smart enough to get on the modular cheap train back in the late 80s, early 90s. Like some people were. 
but at least I got onto the the eBay market when some of this other stuff, like the Proteus stuff, was cheap and some other things were cheap. Um, but yeah, it's just it's like anything else. It's just timing and dumb luck most of the time. <laughs> you know, like I said, that, that Fismo showed up out of nowhere. I was like, how could this be this cheap? Everyone else is selling it for a hell of a lot more. Must be something wrong with it. No, it's just what the guy was selling it for. Same with some other stuff. The problem is the the day I bought the Fismo, I found the Poly Evolver rack, which is you know as rare as Angel Wings, and uh, is about the same price, which is also incredibly good price for that, which is super rare. And uh, I can't buy two at once, so I'm like, fuck, I'm never gonna see one of these again. <laughs> and I haven't. They're just nobody sells them. They didn't make that many, and whoever had, I saw this one guy on eBay has a polyvolver and two racks, and it's got 12 voice polyphony, and it makes these beautiful classical bits and organ stacks and all kinds of stuff. It sounds amazing, but I had to do a workaround with polychaining some polyvolver, or monovolver desktops. It's a similar effect, but I can never, I'll never get 12 voice polyphony out of that. If I'm lucky, I can get eight. But to be honest, four voice is fine. The keyboard is so cool. But four voice is good enough. You know? I'm not a I'm not a shredder and I'm not a master keyboard player, so I don't really need you know four more than four voices most of the time. I don't even think it's 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 multi timbral but you only have four oscillators, so you can't go too crazy with it anyway. You can just do four individual sequences at the most if you want to like a tangerine dream kind of thing which is cool but unless they added more oscillators it doesn't matter how much polyphony you have because it's this is the way it works it's just you've got four oscillators to deal with period and uh so that's why you need the expansion racks but um wild stuff Yeah, TX81Z is cool. You can also get the um, keyboard version. Um, TX27, I believe. DX21 is like two TX81Zs in a keyboard. You can actually stack the voices. So I got one of those a while back because... Uh, there's, there's an interview with that Lego Welts guy who's way into FM and other kinds of weird stuff, and he had a really good argument for it at the time. One of his several reasons why he liked it. So yeah, I found a good deal and I got it. Have I used it more, <laughs> much in the last five years? Not really, but at the time it was fun. And it was pretty cheap. But uh, so you can also get those if you if you want another keyboard. Um, and you can't find a good shape or a good deal on a TX81Z, you can also get the keyboard equivalent. Um, or you can get, I mean, a Reface DX is pretty awesome. It's a wonderful four voice, I'm sorry, four op synth. Um, really good control servers. Uh, small keys, but very playable, very good quality. Um, what's that, an onboard mini looper? thingy that's kind of interesting uh, battery powered has little speakers that look silly but they actually sound pretty good if you just want to play on the couch for a while and the sound mondo app that works with all the reface units is incredible it has this massive library of free patches and you can also upload your own to the group and share them with everybody and um, you have limited memory I think it's four banks times eight presets or something like that um, something like that but it's so it's not a lot of presets but so what you have your phone with sound mondo and the internet and you can constantly download patches all day long to the damn thing now in in 10 years will that still work probably not <laughs> but at least in the short term it's very very cool for quick and dirty auditioning sounds very quickly don't need a computer just you know plug your um your um phone into the thingy uh, 
and uh, go to town. It's very interesting. Super easy to use. I've made a custom mega bank. I auditioned a whole bunch of sounds in just a matter of 10 minutes. And I already had a custom bank of all these beautiful sounds I've never heard before. And they're four op. They're not even six op. And they, they rivaled some DX7 sounds I've heard on a little reface. They sound amazing. In fact, the one... Uh, the video last night when I was driving, the, the song that plays right after I get my coffee and leave the, to, to do the leg two of the trip, the second video, that track is all reface DX, multi-tracked on a, on a looper. So basically, loopy HD on the iPad and reface and nothing else. And uh, the sounds in there are amazing. It's, a lot of those are just downloaded from SoundMondo. Tweaked them a little bit. And uh, it's a great little keyboard. Portable. Hook a bigger keyboard to it if you want better keys or something like that. Uh, cheap. The only one I don't have is the uh, that I want is the CP. Which has really good uh, you know, electric piano and roads and stuff on there. But they have a, a, a debug mode where you unlock a grand piano on there. And it sounds really good. It just, I talked to the guy at, at uh, Synthplex about that. It was actually a diagnostic mode they put in there. And they, they, by the time they were ready to ship it, they didn't have time to remove it. So, and they're not going to do any kind of upgrades and tweak further models. So it's a permanent bug that's left there for you to unlock a grand piano on that thing, which is hilarious. So I thought that was pretty cool. A nice mistake that everyone can benefit from. Quadroverbs are cool. They're dirt cheap. You can even get a Quadroverb 2 pretty easily. Um... Uh, do you have the op six or you're going to get it? I actually, so I was, I missed that whole deal that week. I missed it by like a day. I saw it. I go, Oh, I'm not ready to buy it just yet. Payday's coming. And sure enough, the goddamn thing added just before payday and I missed it. So pissed off and realized I missed it. They weren't going to do it again. I just found a used one on reverb. That's in really good shape. Just about the same price. I had no problems with it. I've only used it a few times, but I had no problems with it. Uh, my friend Manny, who was on the call earlier, is Dr. Synth. So kind of a famous Yamaha synth programmer. He um, he got one on the sale. And because of the nature of the sale, he got a one with a bum screen. Sent it back. They've had it for three months. He's been without an Op6 for three months, all because it came with a bum screen. And it was a brand new unit. And they're making him wait. It's like, what? So here I went and got a used one, maybe paid another 50 bucks more than the sale price was for a used one. And I've had no problems with it. I just got lucky. But man, it's just, that really sucks. And Yamaha's customer service in that case really stinks. So, so the build quality, you know, obviously it's, it's cheap. It's just a, a really cheap plastic case with a Raspberry Pi inside and a basic screen that's pretty good. When it works, it's really clever with the, the color-coded sliders. The lights change based on whether you're in a carrier or a modulator mode for the operators. And uh, the fact that you can build your own custom algorithms is really clever. And it's, you know, it's pretty fun. It's, it's a bit menu divey, but it's a very clever idea for FM. I, other than that, the, it's like the Reface DX, the Op6, or the, um, another great 4-op is the Electron Digitone. Sounds wonderful for a little box. And it's great for percussion, too. And all that great Electron goodness with the crazy sequencing and the, the parameter locking and conditional trigs and, uh, and really wild control of effects per, per step. Um, and uh, it's a trip. You know, the stuff you can do with that thing. I just need to use mine more. I've got too many other distractions. But, um, but yeah, 
Good stuff. Very good stuff. Oh, nice. They got one. Okay, cool. <coughs> yeah, so the DX21 is probably, you know, if you like that thing and you don't care about the module thing. Um, Op 6 is definitely fun. Um, I'd rather have a mod wave, to be honest, because I really like my DW8000, and now I have two broken ones for some random reason. Nobody knows why. I've done all the diagnostics and the factory reset, battery change, patch reload. It's just freaked out. So I found a guy in San Francisco who could fix them probably pretty cheaply, so I'll probably get them fixed at some point. But they'll probably just break again in a couple more years. So the, the cool thing about the mod wave is it doesn't sound like the DW8000, but it does have the DWGS waveforms from the DW8000 in it. So it has the potential to do some of that stuff, but way more because of the control surface is nuts. That, uh, that crazy... Um, They have that weird inertial ball thing where you can actually do this weird thing where it, it pretends like it's it's gravity driven or whatever. This ball moves around the screen and does modulation. It's, it's a trip. It is some really weird stuff on that board. It's still the same kind of cheap build as the Op6. It's very plastic and light. But the control surface is incredible. And also even the wave state is worth getting, I think, too. I love my wave station, but to have all that knobbage and uh, and it's very mini divey but all the editability that the wave station never had until they came out with the app i wave station on the ipad is incredible you can see all the slices you can they loaded it with so many damn cards that were always expensive to buy with all this all the presets on them and there's even an xy pad mode and a joystick to replicate the the joystick that the wave station had for panning and uh, so I wave station for iPad is amazing it's just really good um, but <clears throat> whatever you do don't do what I did where basically when I started getting synths I basically said you know I want one good synth of every synthesis type and then a, a couple different types of samplers and then, oh, how about this? And maybe this? And maybe this? Oh, that looks pretty cool. And then pretty soon you're like, holy shit. <laughs> what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but it, it's it's true. The old saying, the stuff you own, owns you. Because um, it's just so tempting to try new things. Even though you may have most of the sound sets or feature sets of a thing, a new thing comes out, has just enough different stuff just a certain kind of look or interface that really is compelling and then you just keep going for more things and then not only do you not have time to play them but you certainly don't have time to master them and that's the tricky part is although you can get really bored with some gear pretty easily even if you've mastered it and have fun with it because after a while it's a little boring um at least you've like really gotten your uh, times worth out of it and your you know, instead of just throwing another item at the problem you you work around the problems and come up with other clever ways to do it so it's it's the old uh, don't you know, like your parents say, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> it's, it's, it is fun, and it's, it is cool to play with all the gear and have to play with it whenever you want and not have to go to a friend's house and go to the damn store to play with it and all the stuff I used to do as a kid when I couldn't afford this shit. But in the end, it's also kind of frustrating, and, and especially when the stuff starts breaking. 
Especially, it's not even that old. It's not classic analog. It's good quality digital. It's you know, maybe a couple decades old, but it shouldn't be breaking based on the the idea of how it was made and stuff. But that gets annoying after a while. And repairs and downtime, and then you realize more stuff you bought is going to do the same thing in like ten years and potentially. And it's just it gets a little frustrating sometimes, but you still keep buying the stuff because it's just a it's uh, it's fun, you know. It's just fun to learn new things. And although you can't ever have time to master as much as you would like, I think the when every time I get something new, I immediately make a bunch of stuff with it because it is very inspiring. And it's fun and it's new new tools, new technologies, new sounds, new new ways of doing things. Most of the time, not always. But at the end of the day. You're still like bouncing from this to this to that. And that's frustrating. That's why hardware jams has been so cool. Because because I'm doing something at least every week, if not more often, I have excuse to go start pulling dust covers off of stuff. Hey, I haven't used this for a while. Let's try this. Oh, that'd be cool for this. Ooh, that's really this would be neat. So I feel much better now about stuff sitting around because I eventually get to play with it all again with these different challenges that come up. As, as I need some fresh ideas or just have an excuse to, to use it because I think it fits the challenge. So it's really, really interesting way to, to make me feel better about all these stupid things I've purchased. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have a mini log XD. I have a regular mini log because it was so cool when it came out. I had to get one because poly analog with all those features at that price was kind of hard to beat. I hate the keybed on it. It's a terrible keybed, but it's cool that it's portable and um, I ran off a, off a USB bank, so it's like a battery pack kind of thing. Which is, I love portable gear. Sounds good. The little joystick thing is kind of funky. At least the XD has a proper joystick. So I was thinking about getting the module for the XD and putting it next to the mini log. So not only get more voices out of it, but I still get the digital thing and I get the proper joystick because the module also has the joystick. And I don't want to buy another one with the keybed if the keybed is just as bad as the mini log is, which I think it is from what I've heard. And but you only save like a hundred bucks by not getting the keybed, so. It's kind of weird. I wish it would be a little bit cheaper for the module. Um, I tried to get around that by buying the NTS-1. Since the NTS-1 mimics the digital section of the XD. And I thought, well, I could just kind of work around it and it'll work kind of similar, even though it's kind of a bolt-on. But it's not because some of the, the modulation lanes and stuff that's integrated inside it doesn't quite work the same way. But if you're just trying to add another voice and some effects, the NTS-1 is a clever workaround and a hell of a lot cheaper. But it sounds like it's hard to really replace the XD with putting those two other units together. So we'll see. It's still a hot item out there. They're still selling them, so I have time to get one maybe new or on sale if, if I feel like it. But since I haven't used my mini log for a while, I think the last time I used it was one of those jam tracks I played last night. It was all mini log. And that was a lot of fun because the thing does a lot of variety. But <laughs> I haven't taken it out of the bag in a while, so it's just one of those things. It's getting close to midnight. And normally I'm up much later than that, but I do want to do a couple of things before I finally crash, even though I probably should crash now because it's been a rough couple of days. But thanks for hanging out and chatting and doing the sciencey thing with me. 
I love doing this stuff. It's a lot of fun. I ran out of stuff to look at. That's why I just left the coffee on there because coffee was kind of compelling. It was doing some little funny dance for a while. And now it's kind of stabilized. It's not as active as it was. It's, the coffee's heated up. But, um, yeah, it's fun stuff. I'll definitely be doing more of these. I haven't had any time like with other projects and these conventions and other stuff that's been going on. So I'll be uh, maybe try to do these once a week if I can get my act together. The hard thing is actually getting a schedule. I know a lot of people like to schedule their podcasts and their other things, and it's a smart thing to do to get more people involved, but I never know when I'm going to have time to do these things. So I'll just be doing them kind of <laughs> randomly. I also don't want to step on other people's shows. I was, I was on the another synth podcast earlier today when I was finishing up work. And uh, I said, well, I don't want to start it now because these guys are still doing their things. And Like Paul was in there. I know Paul wants to watch these things. So I don't want to be pulling people away from someone else's show. So then I also have to work around other people's time slots. And that's why I basically just wing it. I don't really plan one because... Once I plan it and then someone has to do theirs, it's more prominent. They're going to make me move mine. So I just I just fit it in when I feel like doing it, pretty much. But um, anyway, 2 a.m., yeah. I normally be up to 2 a.m. It's just this is one of those nights where I might push another hour at the most. and probably shouldn't push it much further because it's been a crazy week. So, um, but thanks. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, keep your eye out for the Proteus stuff. Let me know if you have more questions about that. It's one of my favorite, uh, families of gear. So, we'll talk about that some more. But, yeah, the, the, the clone ROMs is kind of a revelation. It's, they planned this for years and years and years and years and years. Finally, some guy figured it out, but no one's really talking about it. Um, it didn't say clone. I don't think it said clone in the eBay thing. I think it just said the actual name of the product. I actually got him to tell me it was a clone in an email, I think. So I said, oh, interesting. So I'm going to have to try that then. So that's clever. That makes me makes me happy because those two are like really hard to get for a long time. And even when they were available, they were still only about maybe 250 Three hundred dollars, something like that. But now, like five hundred dollars, I saw one for eight hundred dollars for just one of those ROMs. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me! It's not that good. It's great, but it's not worth eight hundred dollars unless it's the last one on Earth, you know. Um, so anyway, it's nice that the these guys provided options because Emu certainly doesn't give a shit anymore. They don't exist. And Creative Labs is around, kind of, sorta, but. They apparently got rid of that whole product line and just basically washed their hands of it. So why not have other people, you know, take advantage of that and make something for the fans, you know? So good on them. Yeah, so, I mean, even as many years as I've been doing this, there's still endless stuff to learn. Just like in the sciences, you never stop learning. Because once you've done it, you've either become too much of a curmudgeon or you're bet almost dead so <laughs> I've met plenty of people who are just stagnant as hell in, in anything whether it's computers or science or politics or music tech whatever and uh, every day is supposed to be exciting to a certain point you should be looking forward to new things and learning new things and playing with toys and technology and you know enjoying the nature walks and bird watching if you like that and you know playing with dogs and whatever whatever makes you happy with animals and all that because it's just life's too short to to just be a stick in the mud and and see the world as a I mean it, the world is a mess right now politically and socioeconomically but in almost every other way it's amazing so I try to focus on that stuff as much as I can and it's nice to get in these little hobbies where you can just zone out and just do that. Um, 
yet another reason that's great to be dollist because there's no computer there's no pop-up i'm not looking at facebook i'm not looking at emails i'm not looking at anything just focusing on the task no distractions but that and uh makes a big difference i think but you know if there's anything else your mileage may vary so <laughs> So, I think I'll cut it there. It's been, uh, God, it's been, how long have I been doing this? I think I started at 8 o'clock, 8.30. I think I started around 8.30. So, not bad. It's not a record. I think my record so far was about four and a half hours, maybe five hours. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a good one. I found some good stuff and had some people jump on and have a good old time. Yeah, it's fun to have more excuse for the community. And so I was having a blast when I was driving around last night and all you guys are on there chatting. I was like, oh, this is so cool, but I don't want to talk over the music and I don't want to, I can't really chat when I'm driving. I've got to focus on the road with all the stupid cars out there and the wet roads. But it was just, it was a blast seeing that everyone was enjoying it and having a good old time. So it's just fun sharing all this stuff. So, with that, thank you again, and thanks to anyone else watching the replay, make comments or whatever you want, make requests, you saw some fuzzy fruits, because as you know, peppers are fruits, they're not vegetables, and uh, got some cheese molds, got some uh, other kinds of fun things, not too much critters this time, because the water samples I had were pretty lame, but... I will definitely pay attention when the rain starts up again and get some good random water samples and gutters and little cisterns and whatever I can find that have little collections of water because you never know what little guys you're going to find in standing water. It's just pretty amazing the thing that just pops up in various places. So, With that, I will say good evening and thanks again. I'll catch you later.